Oh, yes. yes. So first, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, it is our mission to inspire the next generation of engineers, innovators, inventors, leaders, science, technology, engineering, and math is what we're all about. And we do that with a K through 12 progression of programs. We start in the youngest ages, kindergarten through third grade, with first Lego League Junior, a non-competitive <coughs> program where they build models out of Legos to demonstrate something they've learned. We're a game-based nonprofit, so every year the themes change and the game changes. First Lego League, they're building robots out of the Lego Mindstorms kit to play a game with Legos and interact that way. First Tech Challenge, seventh grade on up, they're now building robots about the size of a microwave. In today's talk, first robotics competition, building big robots, 120 pounds, very sophisticated machines that they do in only six weeks' time. This program was started by Dean Kamen. He's most famous for being the inventor of the Segway, the wearable insulin pump. He holds over 440 patents. He is our modern day living and breathing Thomas Edison. And it's really cool what he does. But he wanted to transform our <coughs> culture. He wanted to change society. Because he recognized that we were celebrating athletes, rock stars, people who are famous just for being famous. We don't know why they're famous. And he said, there's something wrong with that picture. We need to be celebrating scientists, engineers, mathematicians. So quick quiz. Just raise your hand if you can quickly name a living, famous athlete. Shout it out. Forget raising hands. Shout it out. Name a living athlete. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. <laughs> okay. Who else? Okay. Another one? Okay. Okay. Name me five living musicians, actors, writers. last year 
year we were stacking recycle bins, and a lot of robots were a lot taller than they are. You can see on this game, there's a lot of low-lying robots because they were mostly terrain defenses, and then some balls and a tower defense at the end. The manual also outlines um, aspects of the robot, for example, the perimeter, the weight, the height, requirements like that, electrical requirements. We all have a standard battery. We all have a safety light. You can see the orange one going through the row. They all are there to keep us safe. Um, we also have points that we get for the different challenge portions of the field. So defenses. If you all have been into the robot room, you guys saw some wood defenses there. Um, we noticed, you can see ours is the second one, target robot for food. Um, <laughs> We went for a track design because we wanted to be able to break the defenses. And then we also noticed with the points that um, if you hang on the tower, there's about an eight foot rung, or sorry, eight foot long, like a six foot rung, um, that if you could lift your robot off the ground, you got more points at the end of the match. So that's what that arm is on our robot. So we went with that. And so it's a lot of point analysis um, and then figuring out what is best to do with your robot and focusing on that within your six weeks. You can do everything, but not everyone can, so it's good to pick something to focus on and be really good at it. So Casey, oops, sorry, wrong slide. Zach is going to talk about their robot and the mechanical aspects. Programming. Um, so I'm also one of the programmers on our team, Team 5544. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the programming that a team will do throughout the year. So all FRC teams have a choice in which programming language they want to use. They're allowed to choose between Java um, and LabVIEW. First provides really good support for both languages, including a library that has all the resources that the team would need to get started and to get their robot running. There's also a lot of online support, including multiple websites and forums, where you can go and ask other teams questions about programming. Our team decided to use Java because we have an industry sponsor that provided us several mentors um, that have a lot of experience in software development using Java. Throughout the season, um, you have to not only program your robot, but also set up your laptop with a um, driver control system um, and make sure that it communicates well with your robot. That, can, that involves um, multiple program packages that you have to install on your laptop and make sure that it's running both on the laptop as well as on the brain on the robot. So this year, our team's biggest achievement was getting our drive system my, my team decided to use mechanical wheels, um, which provides omnidirectional movement for your robot. This was quite a bit of a challenge for our programmers to figure out, um, because we're still kind of a rookie team. Um, figuring out how to control all four wheels independently, giving them independent power and motion, was definitely a challenge. Um, we fixed this by tying all four wheels to a single joystick that you controlled, um, putting each motor for each wheel on their own um, equation to make sure that they got the right amount of power. We also put this joystick on an exponential curve to give the driver uh, more fine control of the movements of the robot. Casey, tell us about your robot. Uh, my name's Casey, I'm on Team 587. Um, we use the just basic electrical stuff that everyone else uses. Every single team has a Robo Rio, which is like the brain of the robot. And then we all have motor controllers and uh, power distribution board, which gives you power to your whole robot. Uh, what's unique about our team is that we use an IMU, which in autonomous, which is all programming, the drivers can't control the bot. Um, a lot of teams use this time to do distance. We actually use distance, so we will tell our robot to go five feet, and then it stops. Other teams use go five seconds. Uh, another thing is we have vision, which we use a Jetson TK1 to uh, control, which is like a mini computer, and we program it in C++, and then it tracks the target so we can get accurate uh, shot every time.
So we went for sort of a scissor design. So when our arm extends, you should go see it afterwards if you haven't already, it extends like this up. Um, and that was actually suggested by one of our favorite mentors. Um, and then we were able to adapt it and get it working. Um, you can see some rather large holes on the end. That's where we had to sort of play with angles and things like that to get the maximum height because six feet is not really a short height, especially with a robot so low to the ground. Um, and we were able to really get the correct angle on it, shorten arms, things like that. And we're actually lifting with these massive cylinders, pneumatics. Um, we have four pneumatic cylinders. Um, the two on the side, which are the most obvious, and then we have one sort of in the center, which lifts the, this motion up, and then we have one on the very end, because we found out when we were practicing that we couldn't get our hook onto the wall, onto the rung, and stay within the height limit of the rule book. We were like, okay, what are we going to do? So we cut off 10 inches of our arm and put a hook that extends out past our arm to hook onto the rock. And we were able to get onto that and be really successful. And during our last match, we were able to lift off the ground. All 118 pounds of our robot were lifted into the air. Um, so that was just one mechanical strategy that we went for. And obviously, there were several challenges with it, but we were fairly successful with it. Okay, next, we have Ethan. Hi, I'm Ethan, Terabytes, 4561. We, uh, we have a slightly different design. Um, mechanical is, aside from certain things like you can't use pyrotechnics and basic safety measures, teams are pretty much free to choose what they want to do mechanically with their design. Tracks, extenders, uh, us and Swift use, uh, not Swift, I'm sorry, Girls on Fire, we use pneumatic wheels for our drive system, basically bicycle tires. Um, they sold out very quickly. Uh, so as you cross the defense, they get a nice cushioning effect, and they're grippy and rubber enough to cross defenses. We wanted to go for a more of a multi-purpose design. We wanted to do not everything, um, but we wanted to do many things and still do them very well while doing that. So we don't scale. It was part of our strategy discussion. But our arm is both our intake, our low goal shooter, and it rolls back to feed the ball into our shooter. We've got uh, these green plates were built by one of our sponsors because they required a bit more precision than we have, uh, capabilities than everything else is student built. Uh, it's driven by arms overall from, we've got two uh, bag motors that drive it, little small motors about this big around this long. And our overall gear ratio gives us about 300 to one. Uh, so this arm moves very fast. An issue we encountered was that our belts the wrong size. The size we needed were sold out through many. So we took longer belts, cut them to size, and used U-bolts as open belt tension, which basically tightening them down to bring tension, uh, solving one of our many problems. Fortunately, the belt does not make the complete revolution of drive. It's driven from a belt on the motor, uh, through the gearboxes, and then up to the arm. We also got two dual wheel fly shooters. Uh, drop the arms so you can see it better. Basically, we have two motors on a two to one output shaft so that there's only one shaft going into the gearbox. Two gears that mesh to give us opposite rotation, belts that run to the shafts. So even though we've got two motors, these wheels will never spin out of sync. They are mechanically locked together, and unless physics gives up on us, they will always work, and we will always get a straight and true shot. We've also got uh, sort of our defense, our armor. We took the standard rear of the chassis, uh, put it on my anvil, and bent it to a 100, about 134 degree angle to give us a nice ramp over with. Uh, I did the same thing on the front. I took two steel plates and put them in my forge, forged them together, because we figured we'd be crossing more on the front. So we have two steel skin plates, left a gap for the ball intake, and uh, yes, that's pretty much it. Everything else is electronics and programming to be discussed. So, Kerrigan. Um, I'm Kerrigan from T567. I'm on fire. And as many of you probably know, the electrical components of a robot are kind of important for actually getting the robot to move. So parts like the motors and the router and RoboRio and things like that all have to do with the connectivity of the robot and getting everything to move together. RoboRio, being sort of like the brain of the robot, would um, help connect everything such as it connects to both the router and the battery to make sure everything 
everything actually runs. Um, a really big important electrical component of the robot is its router, which, sin, which receives signals from the driver's station and sends it to the robot. It's sort of like the way a satellite works, in which you send information to the satellite and the satellite sends it to someone else. A really important part of electric, uh, the electrical components this year was the robots were a lot smaller. There wasn't a lot of area up, like upwards that you could put stuff in. So having a compact and safe electrical uh, situation, I guess, was a really important deal. So having our robot, which is the smallest frame and only weighing 72 pounds and kind of being the little guy in every situation, we had to find a way to make all the electrical components super compact and make sure we didn't die trying to fix them. So pieces like wires and servos and everything else had to be put in a certain way that they weren't connecting to the wrong thing or they weren't stretching too far. We had to make sure we had the right wires. But that's, that's pretty much the big problem over the year for electrical. First is more than robots. The robots is the hook to get the students engaged and excited. Because first is a hands-on experiential project-based learning experience. But in the process of learning how to build the robot, they're learning how to work together as a team. They're engaging in their soft skills and getting better at failing fast and failing smart so that they can quickly problem solve and do lots of iterations to get to a functioning robot to get to the competition. They're learning about teamwork. They're also learning about business and finance because the robots have to fit within a certain budget. They've got to come up with the funds to get to their events. They're learning about marketing and social media. How do they engage with other teams in the wider world to spread the message about what FIRST is all about? And how do they help other teams know that, hey, we're here and we would be a great partner for you when we play the game? You too can become involved in FIRST. We're always looking for mentors, whether you're a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, computer science programmer, or a business person, a marketing person, you have a skill set that our students need and we invite you to come and join us and mentor a team. We have lots of students that would love to learn from what you're doing. You can become a volunteer. We have five events across the state and we're always looking for volunteers. Some of those volunteer roles are technical, so you do need to have some technical background to fill those particular roles and we will provide the training for you. Or some of the roles are more ushers, sitting at the safety glass table to make sure everybody has safety glasses. If you have the time, we have a job, and we can make sure you have a lot of fun. Our motto for our volunteers is we promise to feed you, we will clothe you, and we guarantee we will entertain you. So please join us. We have a few minutes. If you have any questions for myself or the students, we'd like to take your questions and help you understand why we think FIRST is about the greatest thing on the planet. Questions? We didn't explain that good. We surely got questions. We might have keep it right down. How would, how would people start a team if they wanted to start a team? How would people start a team? Great question. You come upstairs to our exhibit area, you get a brochure, it's got my name on the back and my email. to funds to help your team get started. The biggest thing you need is the adults and the students that want to engage. Other questions? If you haven't had a chance, please come upstairs and visit us. And I'd like to say thank you to our five team representatives. Woo!